Hello, and again, welcome to BitDev. I'm Santiago Ramones. Across from me is... Terry Ferguson, also known as Professor T-Love of A Bowl of Soul, a mixed stew of soul music. Heck yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my usual first question, uh, who are you? What do you do? Well, um, I live in New York City, and um, um, I work for the Board of Education, and I'm a trainer. Um, I train people on human resource systems here uh, for the DOE. So we basically handle people's requests for information regarding their um, vacation time, annual time, sick time, whether they want to take a leave, uh, what is the policy. So I deal more with human resources. But I would say my second job is mm -hmm. I'm a musician. So I play bass, bass guitar for a band called Waza. Shout out to Waza. Mm -hmm. um, Marty Jaramillo, I met him through the guitar school. And, you know, we're like late birds becoming mm -hmm. musicians. I became a musician at the age of 46. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I decided I like bass and I took some lessons. Um, shout out to Tia. Um, she was my bass guitar teacher and she was the one that pushed me into joining a band, Heck you yeah. know, um, and, um, we've been playing gigs all around New York city. Um, and actually we're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we're pretty good. <laughs> we got some great people, Nikki, Mike, Shanique, who's our singer, Stacy, um, uh, and Paul, who is our drummer. Uh, Nikki is our lead guitar you know, and Marty does uh, rhythm guitar. So just shout out to them. Um, but one of my other loves is broadcasting. And I've always liked broadcasting. Um, one of my favorite genres of music is soul music, R&B music. So my show chronicles uh, R&B from 1949 to the present. Wow. And I bring in all the elements of soul music, which can be gospel, jazz, hip-hop, reggae, blues, you name it, it's all a part of Bowl of Soul. And then also part of a Bowl of Soul is to introduce the new independent artists that are still doing R&B music. Yeah. Heck yeah. So I'm sure you don't feel like talking about your day job and that's fine because we don't have to touch on that because all this music stuff is what I'm interested in. Uh, yes. <laughs> so Listen, I do the J job every day <laughs> since COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Been home, working from home, trying to separate home and work life mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. do podcasting. So it's crazy. It's a crazy yeah. mix when oh, you're yeah. home. <laughs> so I guess, first of all, like, I like starting with very basic questions because it actually gets into, gets into the deep stuff. So, what is soul music? Well, you know what? That's a good question. For me, soul music is about the people, what they're feeling, what's going on. Sometimes it could be something happy and you create a song based on how you feel. Sometimes it could be spiritual. Because a lot of elements of soul music does borrow from spiritual, from gospel. And, but it, it really is music about getting back on your feet. You, could, you have pain, but you don't stay there. Get back yeah. on your feet yeah. and keep moving. Whether you're dancing, whether it's something to uplift you, or it could just be something fun, you know, like hip hop. Or there's some fun R&B song make you dance because I feel like music is what is is universal and it speaks to all people. So to me, that's what soul music is. It's coming from the heart. It's coming from what you live through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, so since a bowl of soul chronicles music from like or chronicles soul music from the beginning, where where is that beginning and why is that the beginning? Well, I would say the reason why I chose 1949 is mm. because before it was R&B. And I always say R&B is the name that 
white executives gave it. Right. Okay. <laughs> but really, before we got that name to make it more marketable, it was like Jump Boogie, Boogie mm-hmm. Woogie, <laughs> Blues. It was that kind of music, music that you heard in the juke joints. Okay. Especially all across this country. And, you know, African Americans basically did not integrate with whites. So, a lot of times, that type of music, you had to go to the black side of town to hear it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a lot of times, whites did go to the black side of town if they wanted to have a good time. They were coming <laughs> to the juke joint. But some of your uh, music, a lot of your great musicians, even your jazz musicians, they played in juke joints. Because that's how they got exposure. You know, same thing from Louis Armstrong on down, West Montgomery. A lot of them were uh, traveling on the road, playing from place to place. Yeah. From the south to the north, Midwest. Um, that's where you heard what I call R&B music. Mm. Yeah. And then I start with 1949 because that's when... R&B started getting a national existence from going from a local city town or juke joint or some little square town, some little town someplace. It went national. Mm -hmm. So they had to give it a national name. So hence it becomes rhythm and blues. Yeah. Who who were the first R&B pioneers in oh. whenever it got that national recognition. Amos Milburn. Um, there's another guy. He did um, Rockin' Good Night. Um, I think is I'm going to give you that name. It was Amos Milburn. Um, you also had... Um, I'm going to give you the names right now. This is, Sorry to this, put you on the spot. This one I played on, <laughs> I played on my show. Um... And he became well-known in the 50s, but he started, um, you know, way back in, in the late 40s. It wasn't, um, it'll come to me. I'm thinking of his name. It'll come to me. It's Roy. <laughs> I think it was Roy. It'll come to me. It's not but, good. Yeah, it'll come to me. Um, like Amos Milburn. Um, you also had this gentleman who was responsible for Aladdin records. He was working, um, in that time period too. Um, a lot of these guys were like blues singers and they would sing, um, in the juke joints. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they didn't start getting popular until they started distributing the records. They were still considered race records, Mm -hmm. but it got national airplay. Now they still was working in the juke joints, right? But it didn't start getting national airplay, airplay until some of the executives said, you know what? We can make some money off of this. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's what music is. If they think mm-hmm. it's marketable. Now, mind you, you still couldn't play as a black artist with a uh, white artist mainstream, mm-hmm. but they still found a way to market those records to us and market it to white kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they would also uh, steal the music and have white artists play it. (laughs) Yeah. And and a lot of times, um, let's put it this way. A lot of gangsters were involved Mm -hmm. in placing jukeboxes in establishments and a lot of times they would, who, whatever this establishment had their jukebox, they had to get a cut. Mm. <laughs> That's how it was. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and even though a lot of people don't want to admit that, but a lot of how we got our music was through how gangsters marketed it. Yeah. <laughs> it really. Yeah. yeah. So let's bring it back to you. Why is this? your passion why why make a show about soul music well it's my passion because i grew up listening to all kinds of music i inherited my father's record collection and my father is a southerner who came from south carolina as a teeny teenager 
to New York in the late 50s. And he wanted to be like Miles Davis. He played yeah. the trumpet. So he was interested in jazz. And he bought a lot of records as a, as a young man here in New mm-hmm. York. Um, not only was he li- listening to um, Miles Davis, but he was you know, like Lester Young. You know, um, he like he did like Woody Herman. He did like uh, Stan Getz. Um, he liked the uh, um, Los Angeles, you know, um, the cool sound um, in terms of uh, Jerry Mulligan. You know, he liked um, Bossa Nova. He also liked Cuban music because a lot of jazz has influence of, of Cuban music in yeah. it. So he had like these big 78 records. <laughs> I don't know if they still have those, but (laughs) they used to have these guys that would do the Cuban jam session. And these were popular records. You know, back in those days, they had cha-cha-cha. People would go to the hall and dance Mm cha-cha-cha, mambo. So a lot of those guys that played, they were in swing bands, Tito Puente. Um, He listened to all of that. And that made me listen to music like Bob Thiele. Bob Thiele is from, from California. So it was all of that music plus Southern soul music, because of course he came from the South. So I was exposed to Stax, Stax records. Um, I was also uh, um, exposed to like Sarah Vaughan, uh, Dinah Washington, Aretha Franklin before she became the queen of soul. (laughs) Um, And also exposed to Motown, the Motown sound. He was heavily influenced by the Motown sound and Chicago soul. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, wanted to do more homework in that area and to, you know, delve a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, And then what makes you decide much later in your life to pick up a bass and start playing? (laughs) Because I think I've always wanted to play an instrument. I started with the flute. (laughs) <laughs> but mm-hmm. that didn't work out too well. <laughs> the flute is a beautiful it instrument. Is. And I've seen like Ronnie Laws, you know, play the flute and, you know, and Bobby Humphrey, great musicians. But the flute was just not me. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I think I've always either wanted to play bass or drums. So it was going to either be either of those two. And I settled on the bass. But that doesn't mean I don't want to play the drums at All some right. point. I think I may want to try that, but that's what made me pick up because, you know, I heard so much music. Plus I used to be a DJ Mm. um, because I'm from the hip hop generation. I'm like the second generation hip hop after um, Cool Herc, uh, Grandmaster Flash, Rock and Rob, uh, DJ Theodore. That's the first generation. Mm -hmm. I'm the second generation where we picked up right after them. We used to get out in the street, used to mix records. Um, and find break beats and rock records, find break beats and jazz records, find break beats and all kind of records. You you never know. It's like when I heard the German um, band Kraftwerk mm-hmm. and they did Trans Europe Express. Yeah. And we got exposed to that. I was like, whoa, that's a different sound. Everybody mm-hmm. was like, wow, that, you know. But when you think about that, that also led to having Planet Rock. Because we started learning about, you know, craft work would use synthesizers, Mm -hmm. you know, to create their sounds. And then when when African Mimbata did Planet Rock, that just threw everybody off. We we was like, oh, you know, (laughs) we just went bananas. So, you know, for me, it was like it was a natural um, marriage, you know, for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So then. What, I guess, being a fan of music for so long and then picking up the instrument, what's something about playing that makes it so different than just listening to it? You know, I I, I think when you play it, you feel it more mm-hmm. because it's a part of you. Um, and, you know, one thing about becoming a musician, you you, you train your ear your ear gets very trained and fine tuned. And it's like, it's, it's more part of the, I feel like it's more part of the creative process 
when you're a musician. It's just that you feel it. It's something inside of you that when you play that instrument, you want to give it your all. Now, I'm not saying there's no musicians that, you know, that don't give it their all, but you can tell when some <laughs> people are faking it mm-hmm. and some people really feel it. And, you know, when I play the bass and I play a lot of rock because the band I'm in, we play rock. OK, mm-hmm. we could play. Um, uh, we did Beastie Boys, um, fight, fight for your right to party. Yeah. Then we can go from that to playing the doors. Mm-hmm. OK, but whenever I play any of those songs, I try to put my best into it because it's not for me to recreate being the Beastie Boys or it's not for me to recreate being the Doors or White Snake or anything like that. It's what we interpret, how we, what we put into it that is what people respond to. And to me, you want that when you play an instrument. It's not to emulate because I'm sure a lot of us wanted to be like this group or that group. I know when the Beatles first started, a lot of their... Um, the people that they admired um, were blues, R&B, um, and they wanted to be like them. But after a while, their sound evolved into their sound, the Beatles sound. Mm-hmm. And they pulled all those elements together to what we now know is the Beatles sound. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. So now that you have been playing bass and you're familiar with it and you're playing all this stuff, all this music that you grew up with, have you gone back and listened to it and heard new things in it? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. (laughs) Sometimes you need to revisit um, music because you're like, wow, that's, that's, that's bad. You know, it's like, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like when you, you revisit, um, like I was listening to, um, you know, in the hip hop days, we used to mix a lot of disco records because mm-hmm. a lot of disco records had some great beats in them. And I was listening to this. You may, I don't know if you know this artist. Her name was Lucy Hawkins. Mm. She had this song that we used to mix called Gotta Get Out of Here. Mm. But then on the flip side, she had this song called Lady of the Night. Mm. And I revisited. I said, you know what? This song is deep. Because I, I started to listen to the lyrics more. And even though it had a driving beat, the song is sad. It's a really mm-hmm. sad song, even though it makes you dance. But it's sad because the lyrics is talking about this woman who is a lady of the night. OK, and how she's trying to make it to survive. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you got to revisit songs, even for the instrumentation. Like one of my favorite bass players is, J- is James Jamerson. James Jamerson played for Motown, right? Mm -hmm. And he also played upright bass. And this guy was just a natural bass player, just like Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix was a natural guitar player. And I revisited some of the songs that James Jamerson worked on, and it's phenomenal. Anytime that I hear my guy and I hear a song that was a very popular R&B song in 64. The song was very jazz. It's it's a jazz Mm -hmm. song, but it crossed over to be R&B. But if you hear him play the upright bass, it's killer Mm -hmm. because it tells you the musicianship and a lot of the studio musicians in Motown were jazz musicians. And you can hear the precision. Um, one of the best, I think, Motown's drummers was Benny Benjamin, because mm-hmm. Benny Benjamin came from the era of Gene Krupa. OK, the swing sound. And when you listen to early Motown records, you can hear that swing beat. You can yeah. hear it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Because, you know, Motown has different phases that it went through in terms of how the music was changing and how it was sounding. But their early records were very jazz oriented underneath. And when you hear Benny Benjamin do, um, you know, play the drums, I said, this guy's killer. Mm -hmm. Like he was like Buddy Rich. Mm. Buddy Rich was a swing, uh, a swing drummer. So Benny Benjamin 
was one of Motown's best drummers that they had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What what kind of stuff are you playing now that you're like, man, this is killing me? Like, it's funny you mentioned like, oh, we, we used to play a lot of disco stuff to pull beats from. And I'm like, man, chic. <laughs> oh, those what? bass lines are insane. I'm clapping for you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> you know why? It's, it's interesting you mentioned Chic. Chic mm. is one of my favorite bands now. Even though when she came, she came out, I was like 10 years old, 11 years old. Chic is killer. Mm-hmm. Even though they, like I said, disco to me is another word for R&B. Mm. Okay, we're talking about marketing now. Disco mm-hmm. is just a marketing term. And, and, and it's sad that disco gets beat up upon and I said, what are you beating up on disco? Disco is nothing but R&B and funk. Mm-hmm. But you get caught up with the word disco because I don't know if you heard, like, back in the days, they had this thing where this guy um, had, like, a kill disco day where they yeah. would burn up disco records. Mm-hmm. This is this is well known. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, because I guess disco was making so much money, yet again, R&B mm-hmm. was making so much money that they felt like it's not as good as rock. And if you think about it, a lot of rock and roll has R&B, mm-hmm. jump boogie, boogie woogie, right? Swing, jazz. But when they put out the marketing terms, it makes you hate the very thing you're talking about. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it's like, chic? What? <laughs> Listen, they had an article. It was... um. Recently, they said that it was the anniversary of good times. Mm -hmm. It came out in August 1979. I'm going to tell you something. When good times came out, a lot of us, we was like teenagers, you know, 14, 15, right? We go out there, we bought the uh, 12-inch single and mix that beat with Mm -hmm. good times. What good times has become solidified in (laughs) history, and this is when Chic was coming to an end in terms of their reign. Mm. That was one of their best singles, meaning best selling. But Nah Rogers and Bernard Edwards said at first they didn't like that Rapper's Delight copped it. <laughs> but as time went on, they were glad they did that because it solidified Chic and Good Times as one of, one of their best records of all time. Yeah. But the baseline is woof, and and Bernard Edwards, yo, that's another bass player. I I, I still want to learn how to play like play like him. <laughs> he had killer bass lines. Mm-hmm. Okay, Bernard Edwards, pfft, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's like what's the other guy? He used to play. He played for Luther Vandross. Um, oh. um, not Vic, not Victor Wooten. Um. Marcus Miller mm. is another one. Marcus Miller played with Miles Davis. Mm-hmm. That's another mm-hmm. guy. Killer bass player. Yeah. But he played for Luther Vandross. Mm-hmm. He gave Luther that bottom in his songs. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? She? Yeah. <laughs> you got good taste, brother. <laughs> um, Bernard Edwards, forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um. I, I mean, it's a good story, but I don't know if, uh, sure. Uh, but the, do you know how he died? I, I don't, you know, I, I think it was, I, I think it's tragic how he died. Um, yeah. Trying to so, figure out. Mm-hmm. so, uh, I heard it from, uh, now Rogers himself, uh, <laughs> okay. but, uh, not that I've met him, but you know, watching interviews and stuff, yeah. um, basically, I mean, Bernard was a family man. He wanted to, like, be at home with his kids. But, like, he also, as you can tell, he put everything into playing bass. And so whenever Niall kept asking him, like, hey, we need to do this tour in Japan and stuff. And Bernard was feeling sick. uh, Uh He he went and played that show in Japan, uh, even though he was feeling, like, deathly ill. Uh-huh. And he played that last show, and then that night he went into his hotel room and he died. Oh wow! So like he he uh-huh. gave his all to the end. So yeah, okay, that's just something about Bernard Edwards that yeah, 
Yeah. Um, so you are this, you are as a great historian for all of this music. What is, I mean, a lot of times people don't tend to focus on history, but seem to miss out on the fact that like everything that we have is built upon what came before. So what do you feel is the importance of maintaining this history of soul music? Well, I don't know if I consider myself a historian more than a a lover Mm -hmm. of the music, but I think what's important is to connect the dots. You have to know, and I think this is why it's important. You need to know how music originated. A lot of people don't know the basis of the music that they play today and how it evolved. It's it's just like with rock and roll. You can't talk about rock and roll and you don't talk about Buddy Holly. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about rock and roll and not talk about Carl Perkins or Dwayne Eddy. But you also can't talk about it without mentioning Lil Richard. Right. That's right. (laughs) Absolutely. Because they talk, they say, the king of rock and roll is Elvis, but I really believe the king of rock and roll is Little Richard. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to, like I said, Little Richard was playing juke joints Mm -hmm. in the South before you and I and everybody else come to know him as Little Richard. He borrowed some of his style from other local artists Mm -hmm. to form who he is. Otis Redding even borrowed some stuff from Little Richard. OK, and you need to know, like, what, what was their life like? You know, a lot of times, you know, like Kanye West did a song with Jay-Z called Otis mm. and they borrowed a track from Try a Little Tenderness. Mm-hmm. And it, I thought it was dope. I thought because mm. Kanye, as far as production skills, I think he got great. And one thing I love about Kanye, Kanye will incorporate elements of old school. Mm-hmm. into his records so that makes you wonder wow where did he get that from where did he get mm-hmm. that track from he borrowed it from somewhere and Kanye also borrows a lot from gospel mm-hmm. a lot of his samples are from gospel records too and he to me I think he does a good job of trying to merge those two together but I think you need to know the origins of where things come from okay and how did it become what it is? Where does it get that bottom from? Where, where mm-hmm. does it borrow from? You know, and it may want you to try to play that music that came before, before mm-hmm. your music. Because when I listened to hip hop, I had to go back and find out where did they get that break beef from? Mm-hmm. Let me find that record. And then when I played the record, I said, wow, this album is bad. Mm-hmm. Even James Brown. A lot of young people would know about James Brown if it wasn't for hip hop. Mm-hmm. Hip, you know, James Brown had prominence himself from the fifties to the to the seventies to to the mid seventies, but hip hop just brought it up to that eightieth degree. Yeah, to make mm-hmm. you want to reach back and say, "Whoa, that," you know, like if you listen to the JBs, the song "The Grunt." One of your baddest bass players, Bootsy Collins, Mm -hmm. and his brother, Catfish Collins, play guitar. And I believe um, Maceo Parker was on there, saxophonist. You listen to that. Even though they snatch different parts, listen to the whole song. It's killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The syncopation. Because, you know, James Brown was very um, dogmatic about you following his directions and how he want that song precision to sound. Mm-hmm. They said he was like a taskmaster. Oh, yeah. But mm-hmm. it is what you hear that, that you know, James Brown never went to school for music. He was self-taught. So for him to hear these things in his head and what he wanted to accomplish was brilliant, okay? But like I said, you want to go back and you want to hear that. You want to hear that. Like, when I listen to Motown, there are songs um, from the early artists that I've listened to, and you see the evolution of the songwriters, of the singers. You know, a lot of people don't know, like, like with the Supremes, that the Supremes were the no-hit Supremes. 
all the other artists that came before the Supremes had hits, like the Marvelettes, right? The Marvelettes was really, I consider, the foundation for Motown, helping them to make money. Mm-hmm. Until he, Barry Gordy, was able to groom the other artists that mm-hmm. came along. But the Marvelettes were able to, I think they got a couple of number one records in the early 60s. But the Supreme, nobody knows that the Supremes were singing for a good four years before they got a hit. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know that. You know, and somehow they, you know, the songwriting team of Holland, Dozier, and Holland, they evolved because originally Eddie Holland was a singer on Motown. He he wanted to sing, but he said. As time went on, he started doing more writing, he and his brother. So when Lamont, Brian, and Eddie became the writers for the Supremes, and they were the ones responsible for catapulting the Supremes' career and the Four Tops' career, Mm. okay, before they became the the main stable of artists, uh, successful artists on Motown. So a lot of times it's, it's like, you want to hear the origins. What did they go through to figure out how they, that they wanted to do this, you know, do this song? How mm-hmm. did they choose that song, yeah. right? What musicians played on it? Because I'm going to tell you, if you listen to a lot of R&B records, the obsessing musicians are killer. Yeah. They, these are killer, killer musicians. I don't care if that record came out of New York City, Detroit, Chicago, the session musicians are the ones that really made a lot of the records that you hear in R&B. And yeah. they don't get the appreciation um, that they should. Yeah. You you mentioned a lot of artists, and this is a question I, I like asking often, uh, since you mentioned Kanye and you mentioned uh, James Brown. Do you separate art from the artist? <laughs> like when you say separate art, you know, no. Hmm. Um, no, I don't. A lot of times artists are whatever they create, that's them. Mm-hmm. That's their art. Mm-hmm. James Brown's art was giving you soul music, like funky soul music, funky R&B. That was his thing. Mm-hmm. He found something that he was able to develop and that became a part of him. That's why uh, James Brown was as successful as he was Mm -hmm. as a black artist, because he found something that he loved. It it became a part of him and it drove him to be better the next time he was Mm -hmm. competing against himself. James Mm -hmm. Brown was not competing against nobody but himself. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Kanye. Kanye, is a, he's brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I think with Kanye, he raises the bar. He raised the bar. And I think he competes with himself. I don't think he competes with anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of times when you have something that you love, you strive to be better each time. Mm-hmm. You know, you take it up another notch. Let's go. Let's go up to another notch. The mm-hmm. same way when I play music. You know, let me tell you, there are songs that we play, I never thought in my life I would play. Mm. But once I learned it, it became a part of me. And it made me strive to play it. Now, I play a lot of jo- Bon Jovi. I'm not, I'm not really into Bon Jovi. Mm. Mm-hmm. But once I learned how to play it, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you playing uh, Living on a Prayer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean... Uh, uh, listen, the, the mm-hmm. bass, the runs on the song, mm-hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> you learn, you, you, you challenge yourself. So it's like you become a part of it. You have to, you know, you don't separate. You, it just has to embody you for that mm-hmm. moment, you know, <laughs> but I think what drives a lot of artists is that it, the music, the art becomes a part of them. Mm-hmm. It does because I don't, I don't think um, that we would get as good uh, material from them if they don't embody it. Mm. Sure. They have to own it. You have to own your art, I, I feel. You do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess one last thing on this front. Uh, since you mm-hmm. are a 
gigging musician in New York. What is the uh, music scene in New York like for you and how how does it interact with all of the different uh, genres and things going on in New York? Well, you know, I, I've been playing in, um, in venues where we play rock, mm. okay? And um, the audience uh, that we play for, they like a certain genre of music, meaning like an era. Mm-hmm. And we play a lot of 90s, like mm. 80s, 90s rock. We might dip back to a 60s tune, a couple. Um, but they mostly like into the 80s and 90s because I think it has to do with the age hmm. of the crowd, you know. And we've been playing um, at Prohibition in New York City, which is a nice venue. Um, it attracts a lot of people, a lot of different people. And the crowd is infectious, but it has to do with the music you play. Mm-hmm. OK, I'm um, not saying if we didn't play R&B, it wouldn't be infectious. But a lot of the crowds that come out to, to see us, they like the type of music that we play. Mm. Um, now, one of my uh, bandmates who um, he has his own band, um, Mike Bennett, um, he has this band called Mike Bennett and a Soul Glow Orchestra. I've checked out his sets and he's played at um, uh, Rockwood. Um, in the city and Orleans Grocery. And that crowd, they um, they listen to all types of music. It depends on the venue, who they attract. But um, he plays, his music is a little bit more R&B mm. and funk. He is yeah. a funk head, okay? Mm. But he's killer. He's killer. And he attracts younger people, like younger mm. than my age. You know what I'm saying? He attracts a younger set. And plus, the people that are in his band are either his age or younger. And um, the vibe there is really hot. You know, now he knows he knows his shit now. He's like one of my music teachers. He mm. knows a whole bunch of music. Very talent, multi-instrumentalist. Um, but his thing, he likes funk. He likes mm. funk and R&B. So when I see him play, I'm like, damn. I said, Mike, you good, <laughs> man. <laughs> you you killer. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like a different vibe. It depends on the venue. Mm. Um, but it's I think it's a great scene because you get a chance to see all types of artists. I played at the Bitter End, uh, which to me was a big high. Mm. Um, because you know the Bitter End um is a very famous place in a village, um, Greenwich Village. A lot of rock musicians have played at the Bitter End. Yeah. Um, and we played there. And I've seen other set, other people open there and they play from blues, rock and roll. So you got a lot of people like rock and roll. They still, they still want to hit it rock and roll. They do. Hmm. They want to yeah. hit rock and roll. Switching gears and there's no good way to transition into it. What is the role of spirituality or religion in your life? Um, it's a big piece um, for me. Um, you know, I, I believe in God. Um, I believe that God directs my life um, and that God is someone that I can talk to, um, that he know he knew me before I came out of my mother's womb. I always believe that because he knows that. Um, and I believe that, you know, it's good that you can pray, you know, um, and have a conversation with God. You know, because really God is the only one that knows your destiny. Nobody else around you know your destiny but God. So whenever I pray to God, I always ask him, you know, to give me clarity, um, you know, to to give me empathy, continue to help me delve deeper into myself and to understand others and to have empathy. um, Because I think, you know, you know, you're not in this world, you come into the world by yourself, but you live amongst other people. And um, you need to be in tune to that, you know, that you care for other people um, and their well-being. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's important to me um, because it gives me comfort and it gives me peace, um, especially in this time of COVID, you know, people are finding out what they're made of. Mm -hmm. What are you made of? You know, do you 
get easily rattled because of this situation? And is this situation any different from any other situation? In terms of the circumstance, it is. But how do you deal with it? Who do you go to? Who do you talk to? Where do you get peace from? Um, and I think during this time, it's whoever you, you know, if you're a spiritual person, if you a Buddhist or whatever, you know, and this is way of your way of communi- communicating with God, then you have to try to get some peace with that yeah. as much as you can. I mean, it's yeah. it's not easy being a human, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. this, but the um, to me being able to pray to God and, and, and center yourself gives you stability, I feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so further pursuing that idea of God, what is your definition of God? All encompassing, all knowing protector. Um, I think provider, because I believe that, your gifts and your talents come from God. He, all of us are different. He gave you certain gifts and talents, and 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 what to what to put where to put those gifts and talents. He gave me that. Everybody's unique, so I feel that as a creator, he's a creator. Okay, he can be a destroyer too, because <laughs> yeah. you know you can be made and be destroyed too. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> You know, but I just see him as a a father. Um, And I know that he loves his children because he made them. You know, he's a discipliner. You know, because sometimes he can convict you. You don't need nobody to convict you. Sometimes people will convict you. You might use people to convict you. But he can convict you because he he knows what's best for you. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, that's where I am with that sort of a tough one I guess but uh what happens when you die I don't know all I can tell you is that I, that what I would hope is that if it comes to that time of your life that you would have felt that not so much what you gave like monetarily did you help somebody yeah. Did you help somebody? Yeah. One person? <laughs> to me, that's important. Did you encourage someone? Did someone, uh, did you help someone in their life? Were you, um, how did you treat them? Mm-hmm. Did you treat people kindly? Were you, did you treat people with love? Yeah. Did you, you know what I'm saying? Um, as far as that's concerned, that would be important to me if um, if if I were dying. Did I do the best that I could while I was here? Did yeah. I help somebody? You yeah. know? Beautiful. It ain't about money. You know what I'm saying? Because this, this COVID ain't, ain't about no money. I mean, it's about money for those that's providing mm-hmm. services. But what I'm saying at the end of the day, is it about money? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we need to live and we need to have shelter because I think that's important. But, you know, a lot of these people that passed away or didn't have to pass away, where was the compassion? Mm -hmm. What do we do for them? Mm -hmm. That's more than money. Because to me, a lot of people that have died during this period, this time shouldn't have died. Mm-hmm. And we could have helped them. That's where I said, did you help somebody? Did you help them get well? You know? Yeah. Yeah. How do you determine what good behavior is? <laughs> you know what? For me, good behavior. I don't know. I just feel like with good behavior, meaning is that you, you know, a, a lot of us, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you. <laughs> There's a lot of bad behavior <laughs> and a lot mm-hmm. of good behavior that we still have. But I think for good behavior, meaning to me is like, you know, do you value people? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Do you respect, respect another opinion? Yeah. You know what I mean? Are you open to another idea? Mm-hmm. Right. 
um, because I, I, you know, I like uh, the guy that I like listening to is John Maxwell. You know, he's one of my favorites. And um, T.D. Jakes is one of my favorites also. And, you know, John Maxwell has said what's going on and happening now is that people don't feel valued. Mm -hmm. And um, that's true. That's like I said, has nothing to do with money. Do you value people? Mm -hmm. To me, if you want to say that's good behavior um, in regards to that, but I do believe you should respect people and, and give people in the ear, you know, because you and I are two different people, right? Mm -hmm. We may not agree on the same things, but we should be able to come to the table and discuss because what's the point? Everybody's mm -hmm. going to be different. But if we agree together that we're going to come together and try to work out things, to me, that, that will work. Then you try to impose on me or me tr try to impose on you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know if you, if that's good behavior. I think it is. I think it's a mm -hmm. sign of good behavior yeah. because I feel like you should respect folks. Yeah. But a lot of times we don't. Mm -hmm. Don't. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. How do we reduce the division? By talking. Conversation. Mm -hmm. We're all different, but we got to have those conversations mm -hmm. and talk about what, what, what do we have in common? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And understand and listen, you know, because sometimes if you can't get past the, my skin color, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But behind my skin color is me. It's me. Mm -hmm. Right. So I still think like you. I bleed like you. <laughs> I might be going through some stuff like you. But if we don't have a conversation, how are you going to know that? Right. Yeah. Definitely. That's right. <laughs> Do you believe humans are evil by nature? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, care to elaborate or? I guess, what can we do about I, that? I, well, I, I think we learn certain things. And depending on who we're exposed to, sometimes can define our behavior. Okay? And, and, and a lot of us, that is the case. Mm. <laughs> that, you know, if we see something, throw a rock at a window, we throw a rock at the window. Mm -hmm. If we're hanging and don't know better that we're hanging around with a bunch of people that are um, hating on someone or calling out their name. Yeah, we follow. Hmm. A lot of us are followers. Yeah. But at some point, something happens that says, you know what? That's no good. And a lot of times what's going on, especially now. People are very comfortable being in the circles that they're in. They don't want to learn nothing. They don't mm -hmm. want to learn about nobody else. Mm -hmm. They're comfortable calling you a name, but not thinking that this person is just like them, going through the same thing, maybe looking for work or um, dealing with some family issue, that the same family issue they're dealing with. Um, but they may have a lot in common, but you won't know that if you call me a name. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we tend to be more followers than leaders. Sure. Sure. What do you it's, think? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. Finish that thought. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> saying sometimes it has to take for someone to tell you it's no good. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to be corrected, meaning mm -hmm. that, you know, you have to be shown that's not the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. What do you think humanity is heading towards in the future? I think it's going to be worse before it gets better. Hmm. And that's usually, I feel, how it happens. We have to get to the lowest of the low. Because I'm going to tell you, when you get to the bottom, only place else you got to go is up. Mm -hmm. You can't get no lower than where you are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you, yeah. you, once you're on the ground, you're on the ground. You flat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so where? So what you gonna do? Go sideways? 
Mm. <laughs> when you at least when you're up, <laughs> you you incrementally go down to the flat part. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but when you go up, you just going up. There's no ceiling. You know what I'm saying? So I feel to me it's gonna get worse before it gets better because people we have to figure out how do we value each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't value each other. You don't if if um especially now with Black Lives Matter. If you don't if you don't value black life, then what do you value? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you value other people's lives? You may not value them either. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So if we're gonna exist in the United States mm-hmm. of America, because that's what it is, of America, <laughs> <clears throat> we have to understand that this is where we live and we have to coexist with each other. Mm-hmm. But again, it comes back to having a conversation. Because mm-hmm. sometimes people don't know that things are systemic unless it's pointed out to them. Right. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, it's not one person saying it. So a lot of people say the same thing. So if there is a trend, then maybe mm-hmm. we need to examine that. What's mm-hmm. going on? What's up? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because if you read, well, I don't know how much reading people do with history books, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, if you look at the formation of the United States, a lot of people will be like, damn, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. When when you you look at Texas, Texas was was owned by Mexico. United States, those that were inhabitants decided they wanted to have a war with the Mm. Mexicans to get Texas. Texas became its own country, separate from the United States. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. If you look at the history of all these areas of the United States, you wouldn't say what you say. Mm. But people, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. People ain't reading no history books. They're not reading <laughs> nothing. And and no, no no knock against social media. I think social media is great for marketing. It really mm. is. But people are getting their news through social media. Mm-hmm. You know? So um, it has to get worse before it gets better. That's the way I see it. Yeah. It is. Because right now, it's not really a great time. Mm. It's not. <laughs> really isn't. What are you optimistic about for our future? What I'm optimistic about is is a lot of the younger people that are raising their voices. That's the way it's supposed to be. Raise your voice. You know, this is your country. Right? Raise your voice. Get involved. Um Become congressmen, congresswomen. Um, Become um, lawmakers, lawyers, litigators. Uh, Develop policy that looks like the social contract you want it to be. Because I guarantee you, when when the forefathers of this country, they developed their social contract of what they wanted to see. It may not have included you, but (laughs) (laughs) listen... They came together, right? Mm. And they became involved. They wrote public policy. They became legislators, uh, presidents. So this is the era where that can change. The the part that scares a lot of people, and I think they're very scared about about that, just like when they were scared in the 60s, the counterculture. They were very scared of the counterculture. Mm. You know, and that's... And if you you flip it back to music, a lot of what was going on in the United States uh, at the time in the 60s was reflected in the music. Mm -hmm. Music was telling society to change Mm -hmm. because of what was going on in the streets. Yeah. Right. So same thing is happening now. You got another generation of young people that can affect change. And they want to see this country go in a direction that's positive for them. And why not? They're born mm-hmm. here. Where are they going? So if you're born here, 
why are you telling me to go someplace else when I was born here? Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> so they want to be part of that. What's wrong with that? Ain't nothing wrong with that. And what's the fear? What is the fear? Mm. This <laughs> country is going through major social upheavals. Not just the 60s, just throughout the, the whole semblance of the United States has gone through many social upheavals. Yeah. Slave revolts, American Revolution, right? Then you have um, um, other, the, you know, uh, the fact that the United States was moving on the Indians, fighting with them, fighting with the Mexicans, because the Mexicans basically own a good part of the United mm. States on the West Coast. Okay? Mm. California. Mm. California is not, <laughs> is not um, what do you call, um, Quaker. That's not a Quaker <laughs> state. I was owned by the Spanish. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying it is we've gone through even riots in the 60s, you mm-hmm. know, Harlem, Detroit, okay, Los Angeles, Watts. We've gone through these social upheavals. So to me, it's like, what's the problem? So if this is, to me, what's enlightening is to see the young people fight back. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. It's just natural. Mm-hmm. See? Yeah. No more different than anything else. But that's what you have to do. Sometimes you have to you have to raise your voice. You have to get out there and be the change that you want to be. Yeah. You know? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> yep. That's right. What makes you content? What makes me content? You know what makes me content is um is that is you know what makes me content that I can eat, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can wake up in the morning. That I my family, my parents are still alive. They're in their they're in their eighties now. You know that makes me happy. Make sure that they're good. You know they're okay. They're being cared for. Um, you know the fact I, I thank God every day. Um, because I've I've been working throughout my life. Um. I started working with the city of New York and then, you know, we had a mayor, (laughs) Giuliani, Mm. (laughs) that he was kicking people out the city. And then I became a consultant, started working for financial services company like Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan Chase and all of that. I got exposed to that. And um, I have my own business, you know, uh, as a computer consultant, have my own computer business for like 20 years, Mm. you know, but, for me, what makes me happy now is that I'm able to do some of the things that I love. That's what yeah. makes me content. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't want to be struggling for everything. You know, some things are worth struggling for. But what I'm saying is to be able to live your life the way you want to, you know, and to express yourself the way you want to and to be around people that love you. That's important mm-hmm. to me. Surround yeah. yourself. with though, And it don't have to be a whole lot of people. Just surround yourself with people that love you and to have your best interests at heart. Yeah. Yep. That makes me content. (laughs) Yep. When will you be satisfied? Never. (laughs) You know, listen, satisfied? Nah. (laughs) Because you know what? Yeah, you never, you never will be satisfied, I don't feel. So maybe some people is different. Um... I think, you know, what satisfaction will be for me is when, to me, when black people will be treated equally. Mm-hmm. That's satisfaction. Sure. That we will have access as well as other people. I'm not negating any other cultures or whatever. But when we're treated fairly, we have access to things fairly. We're able to compete, be paid for what we're worth. And be able to not be discriminated when we go into a neighborhood and get loans that are not uh, uh, have crazy percentages on it. Mm -hmm. To me, I'll be satisfied, but that ain't going to happen. I don't think in my lifetime. Hmm. Yeah, that's satisfaction to me when black people are treated the way they should be treated. Sure. Yep. What advice do you have for people in general? Live your life. 
<laughs> if you had, I don't care what age you are. If there's a dream that you've had, do it. Yeah. Because don't have no regrets. Live your life. If there's something, a business, that idea that you want to bring to, to the front, if, if you want to learn how to sing, um, if you said, oh, I want to learn how to ski or I want to be a seamstress, <laughs> live it. Do it. Yeah. You know, like my mother, I'll give you an example. My mother played piano when she was a little girl. Mm. Then she stopped. For a long time. Then when she be she turned 60, 63, 64, she picked it back up. And she didn't forget how to play. Hmm. Yeah. That's always been in her. Mm-hmm. But she, there was a period she stopped. She went to high school. She be, went to nursing school, had her own career and everything. And within all of that, she did like to sing. She was singing a choir and everything. Mm-hmm. And then she decided to take up piano again. Yeah. Late in life. Yeah. And she went for lessons across town in the Bronx. Uh, Professor Collins, he's deceased now. But she would go. He would teach her singing and playing the piano. And my mother played with both hands, not one hand. I only mm-hmm. could play with two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> she played with both hands and very good. She was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she was good at it. So that's why I said... <laughs> Whatever's in your heart, do it. Yeah. Awesome. You know, live your life. Yeah. Yep. Lastly, Mm -hmm. potentially most importantly, cake or pie? That's hard. (laughs) Because you know why? Because this... (laughs) I like German chocolate cake. Mm. It's like deep chocolate. But then (laughs) I like sweet potato pie. That yeah. Ah mm-hmm. uh, yes. I like chocolate cake. Cake. Sure. Chocolate cake. All yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Chocolate cake. Awesome. Um Terry, thank you so much for doing this with me. No problem. <laughs> uh it's been great. I think uh I learned a lot. I think uh, my <laughs> listeners are gonna learn a lot. Um <laughs> and I'm excited to uh listen to all of your stuff. Where can we find you and your things? Well, what what I wanted to come back to just real quick. Sure. I, I named you the early R and B greats, right? It's Amos Milburn, but one was Louis Jordan. He was very okay. popular <laughs> um during that during the late forties. Actually the thirties <laughs> and the forties. Mm. Um, but those were like the early R and B pioneers. <laughs> I wanted to get back to that. But you could catch me on a bowl of soul dot com where you can download my podcast. It's, um, I call it Transistor Soul because mm-hmm. we don't really use transistor radios, but guess what? Your phone has now become the new transistor radio. Right. If you think about it, <laughs> right? So you could download it there. You can listen to my show on uh, Live 365. I have a radio network called Ebola Soul, mixed two of Soul Music Radio Network. Just look for Ebola Soul. You have 24 hours of soul where it's programmed, little, limited commercials. Um, you may catch a couple of podcasts that I also program on that station. Um, you can catch me on www.prn.fm at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'm also on iHeartRadio as well. Uh, Deezer. Um, I recently, this gentleman, Nigel Thomas, shout out to him. He put me on his uh, soul network called Surrey Hills Soul Train. Mm. And um, I'm amongst a lot of great DJs, um, R&B DJs on that network in the United Kingdom. So I'm on like three nights, three nights a week there. Yeah. Um, in England. You're international. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's good. It's good. I was like, whoa, you know, so because he was listening to my show. So mm-hmm. he's like, Terry, I want you to come on my network. I said, all right. You know, mm-hmm. and I checked him out and I said, wow, he got some, got Will Downing. He's got a lot of, uh, he got killer, <laughs> he got killer lineup there. So I'm, I'm in good company over there um, as well. I'm on radio, uh, radio garden, which is like satellite. You can see all the satellite radio hmm. stations in the world that you can listen to, but a bowl of soul is on radio dot garden um, cool. as well. 
um, which is to me, I thought it blew my mind because I could go to the Bahamas. They got you could see it'll tell you all the little <laughs> radio stations on the globe. And if you zoom in, like I was listening to a radio station in St. Kitts, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you could pick up like that. I'm telling you, tech technology is killer. <laughs> so yes, radio, radio dot garden. Um, is one and um, I'm on Stitcher Stitcher Radio and uh, Radio Public dot mm. com and Radio dot com um, as well cool so yeah <laughs> those are some of the locations everywhere that I'm at yeah <laughs> yeah and you can hit me up um, I'm also on Facebook so like my face Facebook page a uh, bowl of soul and mixed stew of soul music yeah. um on Facebook and I'm on Instagram, P R O F T Love. Heck on yeah. Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> and you can email me, bowl of soul at gmail.com. All right. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, Sherry. Um, All right. <laughs> I'm Santiago Ramones. And I am Professor T Love of a Bowl <laughs> of Soul. You can find everything that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com. I make music. Bloom is available now, streaming everywhere. Put it on in the background or show it to your friends so you can all enjoy it together. You can also buy it on Bandcamp and get bonus content so you can sit alone in the dark with your headphones on and listen to the album in its entirety while reading and looking at the bonus content. I also make music with PowerCycle, an experimental electronic trio. Our first completely improvised album, Too Many Damn Cables, is streaming everywhere. To support this podcast, leave reviews, comments, tell your friends about it, and buy my music, because by supporting me, you're supporting the podcast. I always end the podcast with my three things. They shape my life philosophy. Those three things are, love never fails, it's going to be okay, I might be wrong.